Hi guys, welcome back to the Soccer Queens podcast. Today is going to be another fantastic discussion, but before we dive in, if you have not subscribed to the YouTube channel already, please hit the subscribe button below so that you can get updated anytime there's a new video or a new podcast episode. The Soccer Queens podcast is only going to be on YouTube from here on out. So sorry, you have to deal with all of us only on video <laughs> moving forward, but I just want to really simplify my podcast and just stay in one place. So hope you guys enjoy and just please subscribe below. So today's guests have been asked to come back on by popular request. So Don Williams and Steve Rollins have probably been my most viewed episodes this year. And I think maybe ever. <laughs> so uh, Steve did a great episode on standing out as a soccer player, really spoke to what it takes to be good tactically and technically. And then Don came on for, I believe, a two-part series on college recruiting. Uh, but both Don and Steve work for SRUSA and they work in the recruiting space. And we really want to cover today academic requirements. And I'm, I'm just going to kick things off with a, a personal story. So when I was recruiting at, at Johns Hopkins, a few years ago, I was wowed by a few players at some of the camps and they were ECNL high school Americans. They showed really well at the camps, but then me, as well as the rest of the coaching staff, we were very discouraged when we saw their SAT and PSAT scores. And nowadays the academic requirements have changed for a lot of the schools. Uh, I believe Johns Hopkins now is a 1500 SAT. Correct me if I'm wrong or thumbs up guys. Is that 1500, 1450? The men's coach told me 1550 when I saw him at the MLS next event last year. So very high. Wow. That's really high. And yeah, so it's, it's super competitive now. And I just look back on when I got recruited and I wouldn't have made the cut. Uh, I had an average SAT score, a really good GPA, but I was not good at the, the test taking. Um, so nowadays I wouldn't have gotten in. The coach would not have supported me. And a lot of these players are finding that if they want to play at these academic schools or Ivy leagues, they just won't make the cut, uh, even if they're fantastic soccer players. So that's just, that's my story as far as recruiting. It's definitely changed. And I know, Steve, that you're really well-versed in this, uh, especially with some of the Ivy League and the East Coast. And then, Don, you're more on the West Coast and state side of things. So let's, let's uh, chime in with Steve real quick, and then we'll pass it over to you, Don. But Steve, let's talk about requirements for, for Ivy League as far as SAT, uh, GPA, AP. I'm trying to think any, anything else. I mean, uh, classes you need going in, like MIT yeah. and all that. So let's, let's just jump in here. So, so a lot of the schools, as we sit today, for the 2022, and a lot of them have announced it for the 2023 graduates, are going to be test optional. And I think this is where a lot of kids get into trouble. Test optional doesn't mean don't take the test. Test optional means if you bomb the test, we won't tell the school so it won't be held against you. But if you go score a 1550 on the SAT, you should have that on your T-shirt when you show up to camp. Right? Because, you know, that's a great thing. And now a coach doesn't have to worry as much about the admissions part and he can focus he or she can focus on the academic part. So, you know, people hear, oh, test optional. The other thing with test optional is because a lot of these schools are test optional, they're getting so many more kids apply. So what you're seeing is the acceptance rates plummet. So schools that three, four years ago that were maybe 15, 18% are now seven, 8% acceptance rate. And that's, and that's a lot because, you know, we, we don't put it out there that you have to have a 1500 on an SAT or a 1450. So kids that are scoring 1100 are now applying to, to these schools. And, and so you're seeing the acceptance rates plummet. The other thing I would say is besides just the standardized test, 
rigorous schedule for the and and remember we're talking maybe the top 10 percent academic schools in the country right this is not a universal st statement but if you're talking like the ivies the baby ivies you know you're really top liberal art colleges too um as yeah you know, as johns hopkins is rigor of schedule really really important so you can have a 98 average and take modern basket weaving and that's going to be counted against you right so on your top schools, they want to see that you took the most academically strenuous schedule that your high school allowed you to take. And so, you know, I know a lot of kids will sit there and says, well, I love history. So I took all the history classes, but, you know, I took remedial chemistry or I, I didn't take advanced math. At the really, really top end, you're going to struggle to get in academically and I assure you, your soccer is not good enough to make up for that. So uh, as far as, let's clarify what, what baby Ivies are. Um, so, or like schools like Hopkins, what, what are some other schools in that category? Like Emory, um, is it Washington, University of Washington, I think? Oh, Washington. So, so Wash, yeah. Yeah. Wash, Washington, yeah. yeah. So, so the baby ivies are generally your NESCAC schools. So Williams, Amherst, Tufts, Colby, Bowden, Bates. Oh, a coach is going to be pissed at me because I'm sure I forgot. <laughs> so, so the other NESCAC schools. But that, 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 that conference is up there. And then you have schools in some of the other conferences that are very high end academically. So your RPI, your Vassar, your Johns Hopkins. Um, your Franklin and Marshalls, um, the, the, there's a bunch of them. But when people generally refer to the term baby Ivies, they mean the NESCAC conference. Don, do you have anything you want to chime in on? Uh, yeah, the no, West Coast has got a couple. We've got uh, the Pomona Pitzer schools, the Claremont Mudscript schools. Occidental often gets thrown in there. Uh, I think you mentioned it, Steve, Emory down in Georgia. Uh, uh, you mentioned you wash in St. Louis and yeah, there, there's a few in the country that when, when Steve and I have clients that come to us with lists that are higher end academic kids and are hoping to get into higher end academic schools, it's almost always the same schools on the list. It's almost always the same, same leagues. And, and Steve, you, you named them. And I think that that's, yeah, I think that's pretty accurate. I don't want to miss. There's there's the one school in Minneapolis, McAllister, as as well. Oh yes. We it's, we we should we should throw that in because just because of location, they get overlooked a lot. But really, good good academic school in from the Midwest. Let's let's come back to the SAT requirements for for all these schools that we just named. So are we talking? So if you're an amazing soccer player, you must have a 1500 SAT or higher. No, so. A lot of these schools are, are test optional. Um, so you can, you can get in without the, the SATs. But again, if you're a 1500 SAT or higher, that's, a, that's another badge that you can you know, stick on your chest. So you know, I wouldn't just assume that my GPA is going to get me in if I can score that well on the test. The other thing is a lot of the academic aid is based upon standardized testing scores. So how much money you can get academically, and especially on the D3 schools that have no sports money, right? So you're talking need and academic. Um, a, lot of the, a lot of those programs require um, the testing scores. Not all of them, but, but a lot of them do. So it's, and, and this is how you know, I tell kids to do it. Just assume that you need to take the test and do well, and if you don't, we'll pivot. But it's better to go and take the test and do well and have that problem than not take the test and need it. So, you know, I, I just really don't see the harm in, in taking the test because it could help you. It, it, it may not, but, you know, then you're rolling the dice. 
Yeah. And it's probably one of those things that can give players an edge because everyone's applying to these schools. Everyone's a good soccer player. And if you have a 1550, you're going to stand out and they're more likely to pick you than that, that other girl who also is just as good of a player, but maybe didn't do as well. Now let's just quickly touch on the ACT. Um, some schools require it. Some, some don't, some look at it or suggest it. What, what about these higher academic schools nowadays? So, so, so in, in my experience, SAT, ACT, it doesn't, it doesn't really matter. Submit the one you have the better score with. Uh, I, I don't know any ahead. school that requires one or the other. If they take one, then they take both. And what I've noticed is that, uh, at least with our clients that we deal with, I always tell them, look, just go in and, and somewhere in that soft, end of sophomore year, you should have enough classes, enough understanding to be able to at least go ahead and take the test. And if you take the ACT and you take the SAT, I've noticed that most of our kids score better on one than the other because they are different form. They are formatted differently. And then take the one that you felt the most comfortable with. Now go study that one. Now go hone in on that specific test. And we have one of our boys this last year, he, he did that and he ended up scoring a 28 on the ACT and felt very comfortable there. Went back and studied and then retook it again at the beginning of his junior year. And then got a 31 and then halfway through his junior year, took it one more time, got a 35 and he said, okay, I'm done. That's good. That's a 1590 equivalent SAT. And he's done now in his junior year. And what a good feeling for him to be able to say here at the end of his junior year, I'm done with my tests. I can just now focus on my soccer and the rest of my grades. And then what happens happens. But what that does for a kid is it changed our entire conversation of his recruiting process because before that it was mostly state schools, which was perfectly fine. And some were big state schools and some were flagship state schools to, are you interested in MIT? Are you interested in Amherst? Are you interested in the Ivy leagues? Because now, as Steve said, that test score is quite phenomenal and it will pique the interest of college coaches at those schools to at least want to say, now does the soccer match? We know the academic matches. There's no doubt the academics match. Now does the soccer match? So we've only got one remaining piece of the puzzle instead of two and three that we're trying to link together to make a good picture for where that player goes. Thanks for touching on that. It, it definitely opened the options for him. And that's really encouraging for, for other athletes as far as getting good test scores, but also having a good GPA with rigorous schedule. And I know Steve has tweeted about this extensively and you were at a tournament, I believe last month. And you said, Hmm, all these players have above a 4.0 what's going on with that. <laughs> so what was going on with that? <laughs> So I think a lot of it is, you know, kids don't want to put down the real number. You know, there's, there's a little bit of that. Um, maybe COVID had something to do with that, that, you know, schools were easier grading, you know, cause school was online for a couple of years. So, so more kids did, did better than that. And then, you know, there are also schools that do funny things and, and, and from a high school standpoint, so there are schools that are, you know, grade on a one to four basis and, and give a 3% bump for an AP class or, a, or an honors class. There are some that will give a 3% bump for an honors class and a 6% bump for an AP class. There are some that grade through a one through five scale. And so the, the GPA um, is becoming more and more difficult until you can see a transcript to to get through. And I'm starting to see in some of the folks that we deal with that some of the high-end academic schools want to see transcripts now be before they'll come out and see you. I mean, it's, it's not a lot, but it's it's a couple. And five years ago, I couldn't recall any.
So for players who have maybe a three, nine or a four, O who don't have any AP classes, you say that they shouldn't even try to go out to like a Princeton camp. I, I would say I never want to tell a kid not to try. Mm -hmm. Right. I would say, understand that academically it's a stretch school. And, and remember it's, it's more than just getting in, right. You, you want to be at a school that, that you can do well. And if you're in a weighted three, nine, no higher end classes type of kid, you know, those top end academic schools are, are going to be tough for you. I mean, it's, it's just, it, it just is what it is. Now, as far as specific classes required, I want you to share your experience. I believe it was talking to the MIT coach um, and certain math requirements that they absolutely need. Um, and is this the same for other Ivy Leagues? So let's just touch on that. So, 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 so yeah, so, you know, he was very conscious of, of rigor of schedules. And so, you know, MIT is a high engineering school. So when you're looking at the maths, they want to be sure that you're taking the highest maths available. Um, and, and I think the easiest one was, you know, your AP calculus, right? Whether you take AB or BC. And it's not like, oh, if you take AB, you can't get into these schools. Just understand that most of your competition is taking BT, right? So, so nothing in and of itself is a, you must do this or this won't happen, but it's most of the kids that are getting into our school are here and, and taking this type of rigor. And if you're not there, that's, that's a, a strike against you. It's not three strikes, but it is a strike. So, you know, when you're talking about the high end academic schools, especially in your engineering and you're taking the second or third toughest math class in your school, you're not really um, in the same ballpark as, you know, the kids you're competing against. So Steve, uh, you've talked to me and, and I've talked to college coaches back there about how each coach typically has a set number of what they call preferred admission spots. Would, would you please describe what that is and how that works? So, you know, depending upon the school, some have none. And, and Erica can speak to that better than I can. Some have one or two. Um, I, I don't know of a single school that has more than three. And, and by three is, is a kid who's borderline or slightly under what the incoming classes averages are, or SAT scores are, that that coach can, you know, pull a favor. Hey, get, I, I know what you guys want to see from admissions is a weighted 4.2, but I have a kid here that has a weighted 4.0. Everything else is great. Great soccer player. Can, can they get in? Uh, a lot of the schools will say, okay, coach, we'll, we'll, we'll let you, you know, use one of your chits for that. Um, but that's not the 3.4 student, right? We're talking somebody who just misses or, you know, is, is in, so there's tiers, right? Here, here are kids who are tier one academically. Here are kids that are tier two. Here are kids that are tier three. And we take, 90% of our tier ones and 50% of our tier twos and 20% of our tier threes, right? Because just because of the way college admissions work, right? You can't go all tier one because you're not going to get a bunch of those kids. They're going to go to some of the other schools. So, so they do do that. And so where they are on the tiers also, you know, helps, helps the coach. Because if you're a tier three, you know, so you're, you might not be part of the 20% they let in, but the coach can, can, can get you in and, and get you into that, into that 20% where, you know, if you're that tier one student, and this is why I say 1550 on the SAT, go tell everybody, everybody will listen to you. Um, 
those tier ones, they're not really using their favors for those. Yeah, that that that's right. It's it's usually no more than three. And I, I remember a few years ago, the the Hopkins staff wanted a, a player from South America and she was one, one of those players. She had like a, a four one or four two, but her SAT was just below 1500, like a 1480, 1490. And they, they used um, their preferred admission for her uh, very amazing player. But again, it's like, it's not worth the gamble still. If you want to go to these schools still, aim your highest and don't just rely on these meager preferred spots. Um, just, just really make sure that you're, you're meeting those requirements. Is is there anything else that players should consider? We touched on SAT, ACT, uh, rigor of schedule, GPA. Is there anything else academically? We scholarships as well. That that's a good point too. Yeah. So, so, so there's, there's always other things that, you know, get, Okay, I thought I was on mute for a second. That 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 come into play. So, you know, did you do community, especially on the liberal arts schools? Did you do community service? Right, big thing. Um, how well rounded are you? Right. Yes, I have a ninety eight GPA, but I only take social sciences classes. Right. So, you know, did you take a few art credits? Did you take? You know, where did you stop your language? You know, do you have three years of language or did you stop at one? You know, so they're what they're looking for is for kids that are well-rounded and doing above the minimum that their high school requires, right? So these are the kids that are pushing the maximum of what they can do at their high school rather than accepting the minimum. Yeah, that that well roundedness is is a big one uh, for these schools. So and those um, test scores, Erica, you know that applies to certain financially. It applies to certain state schools too. We had uh, Louisiana State University LSU that was uh, we're in conversations about one of our kids, and we're talking about money and money mattered with this particular family, and they needed some help to order to make that kind of a school work out out of state across the country. Need some help, and so. Uh, Sean Hudson sent me the from their website, I guess, what their requirements were to try to get money. And it was fascinating to me because I hadn't really seen this before. 3.0 was all that was required GPA wise. Then it went off of test scores. So in other words, and I'm I'm making up the numbers now because I don't have it in front of me. But if you scored a 1300, it was going to give you uh, an additional $3,000. If you scored a 1400 or better, it was going to give you basically three quarters tuition. But if you got up into those, uh, 1450 and above might've been 1500 and above, it was full ride. To a coach that, uh, goes to a school that can stack in other words, offer academic aid and, athletic aid and combine them both is that that student now becomes fascinating to that coach because the family won't be paying anything out of pocket as far as tuition goes means the coach maybe at most has to cover a little bit of housing and food to get that kid close to a full ride uh so that coach isn't spending a ton of money out of their own soccer athletic budget at the D2 and D1 level, they can rely on the academic aid to get that kid uh, and that family some money based on test scores alone. So while I, you know, there's 1,600 women's programs and 1,300 programs in the nation, and I don't know that there's a human being alive that has them all memorized, but you know that if there's one school, there's more than one school right? Can't be only one, probably not only one school in the country that goes by SAT, ACT to grant financial aid. In fact, I know it's a fact because we've talked to a number of NAIA, Division II, Division I coaches, as well as Division III, obviously, where the financial aid that comes through is going to be based on test scores and or GPA. Can be both. 
that's good to know because I know everyone's looking for so, some extra money and uh, that's, that's good news. And I, I got an academic scholarship. It's small, but you know, at the D3 level, you can't rely on the athletic scholarships, but even at, at the, the state school D1 can't rely on it either. So those grades, those test scores are, are going to help even, even if just a little. So as far as the, the state schools, I mean, this is such a broad category. <laughs> um, Don, do you want to just start with a certain tier of state schools as far as academic requirements? We could go as far as like West Coast or the highest of the high D1. Like what, what do you want to talk about first? Yeah, well, what I think what every parent needs to understand is virtually every state has what they call their state flagship school. Okay. So let's, let's just take uh, uh, University of Wisconsin, right? Or the University of Indiana. Uh, University of Indiana is different than uh, Indiana Evansville, for example, okay? When I was in California, we've got UC Berkeley, we've got UCLA, which is not on the same level as uh, UC Merced, even though they're both in the UC system. It's not their state flagship school. And then you've got the state schools. Uh, you know, I was at Cal State East Bay and there's 23 of the Cal State schools in the system. Um, now the, the significance of a state flagship school is typically that's where state funding projects go. Uh, so if they have a research project or if they have uh, a medical school, they, those would be typically, or if they have a law school, those would typically be attached to the state flagship schools, may or may not necessarily be attached to the other state schools. So at Cal State East Bay, look, lovely business department, lovely kinesiology department, uh, you know, a lot of health sciences, they have nursing, uh, but we didn't have a law school and we didn't have a medical school. Where at UCLA, we would have something different, or at Cal Berkeley, we would something different. And the engineering programs would be tied to those state flagship schools more often than not, uh, may or may not be, be attached to the other state schools that would have a more liberal arts curriculum or have, uh, if they were into the sciences, it was going to be just a general biology degree or a general chemistry degree, that type of thing. Um, so now the state flagship schools are generally more difficult to get into. They're in higher demand. The more well-known schools are going to be higher in demand. The bigger schools, the Penn, the, the Penn State University versus Penn State Altoona, okay? D different types of curriculum that may be flowing through those schools and different admittance factors that could be flowing through those schools. Um, State schools are probably more flexible from a coach's standpoint. If I have um, a U.S. national team player that wants to get into mm, a specific state school that's a state flagship school, uh, probably a little more flexibility for that coach, a little bit more than, than another player. Although, you know, I had the UCLA coach uh, Ryan Jordan talking to me about one of our boys who's at Evansville now, Max Broughton, and said that because of the types of classes that he took, even though it was all, I think he had a 3.8 GPA, so all very good grades, he was taking a different curriculum than what they call the A-levels in England, which is the higher college preparatory curriculum. Um, as opposed to the BTEX, which is what he was taking, uh, because of the types of classes he was taking, he wasn't going to be able to get into UCLA, okay? So GPA isn't all that matters, as Steve said, that even that, that, that transcripts can matter to certain state, state flagship schools also. So state flagship schools being the more difficult to get into, uh, depends on the state, depends on the school. Um, and then the typical average state uh, sponsored school is going to be a little bit easier to get into. Now, from the NCAA standpoint, we're talking about 2.6 division one and 2.3 division two GPA to get into, but here's the reality. If I've got a kid 
wanted to come play for me at Cal State East Bay, and they scored a two point. If they had a 2.3 GPA, I'm scared to death that this kid struggled in high school to barely pass classes. What's going to happen when they're on their own in college? Is this a kid that I'm going to be at the end of the season go, oh, well, I got one year out of them. They're not academically eligible anymore to carry on. That concern, those, that process did go through my mind. And if I find two equal players, fairly close even, and one's got a 3.6 GPA and one's got a 2.3, three GPA, I'm probably leaning towards a 3.6 kid. Hey, I'm thinking of myself, selfishly, for our program, at least I might have an academic All-American here if I can get this kid enough playing, playing minutes. Uh, and that does help my program and it helps how we look to our administration and it might help me keep my job rather than, oh, you had another kid that dropped out, Don. You've got another kid on academic warning. You've got another kid, oh man, okay. That can lead to a coach losing their job. Absolutely, 100%. There are coaches that if they're struggling in other areas, that could push it over the edge. So grades do matter. That, that's the reality is even at the state school level, grades matter. So, so Don, I don't know if you've had this, but it's almost the first question, you know, when I'm talking to a college coach about a, a PSA, what are their grades? I mean, almost, almost to, to, to a person before they even start soccer, what are their grades? Did what are you, the grades did you and what that? kind of person are they? Perspective, PSA, prospective student athlete, by the way, for anybody listening who doesn't know. Uh, those are the two questions. You're right, Steve. What are their grades? What kind of a person are they? What kind of family are we dealing with? are probably the two most common top three questions that I get to, just like you. You guys have a secret insight now. So that's, that's great to hear. Um, as, so as far as state schools, I'm just trying to think of some of the, the popular ones where a, a lot of soccer players want to go, like your UNC's, um, University of Wisconsin, um, UCLA's like, do they have that, that minimum GPA requirement? Are they looking at an SAT requirement or does it, does it not matter? Well, yeah, remember, so we're talking about all things being equal. So there are, UNC is a great example. So you have UNC Chapel Hill that as state schools go, probably on par with, um, as we mentioned, UCLA. Very, not that easy to get into. Very high demand. But then you have UNC Wilmington, right? You have UNC Asheville. And you have these other University of North Carolina schools that are not Chapel Hill, okay? So now when I can, I can pretty much assure you that the number of students writing to UNC Chapel Hill is a far greater number than UNC Asheville of, I want to come play for you, okay? Coach, I want to come play for you. I want to come to your camp because it's very famous, right? Same thing with uh, UCLA, very famous. I don't know that there's anybody who's educated anywhere on planet Earth that hasn't heard of UCLA or Cal Berkeley, right? Th those might be two of the schools where they would say, yeah, I know those names of those schools, even if they're in England, right? Um, so the amount of students that are very good soccer players that they have to choose from is a larger pool. So then when you look at the total GPA of those teams, you will probably see that they are higher than at, um, you know, some, some other state school, you know, uh, yeah, certainly higher than they would have been at Cal State East Bay. Um, across the board. So because the coaches can be a little bit pickier and because the student admission departments are a little pickier, you have to meet both. You have to be a, not only a good player, but you have to have, it doesn't have to be 1550 SAT, but you know, most of those kids are probably pretty smart. They're probably scoring in the 1350 range anywhere between 1280 and 1350, probably in there. 
and they probably have an unweighted GPA of fairly rigorous classes sitting somewhere in the 3.8 range, more often than not. And do a lot of these schools still consider more in-state than out-of-state athletes? I know like UNC mainly accepts in-state, um, but there's also like international players in the mix too in, in certain scenarios. So how does that all come into play? It's a very hit and miss. It's a very difficult one for me to name, to, to nail down because what we're seeing in the world of college admissions is social engineering in action. So they are deciding, uh, you know, I was talking to the Amherst coach not that long ago, and they said, right now, ideally, we would love to have some more first-generation players coming into our school. Players that have not, families haven't gone to college, uh, that might be on the lower end of the socioeconomic scale. Now, in two years' time, that could change. They might meet a sat certain saturation point and they may, so when you sit in, so I've been privileged enough to be able to sit in uh, certain committees of schools where all of this is being discussed, talking about what type of student body we need to start targeting over the next two or three years to balance out our student body so that we don't end up with all uh, Caucasian, affluent kids, that we have diversity on our campus. And so what they ask a college coach to, to try to get, although they aren't saying you must only get, but you know, if you want to curry favor with your bosses up in the upper echelons of administration, you will try to do what they ask you to do. And that is target the type of student that they are trying to get on their campus. So that is a loaded question that can vary from not only state to state and school to school, but from year to year. It can, it can change, it can, it can turn. Uh, I know the Johns Hopkins coach was saying that four or five years ago, the 1550 academic number that they were telling him that the, he needed the target wasn't the same number, that that had changed based on the president, the administration, and how they felt that John Hopkins wanted to be presented and, and wanted to go after. And that's within the right of the administration to be able to do that. That's why they're hired by the board of trustees is to be able to make necessary changes and to foresee what's going to happen in the schools. So while I didn't answer the question. I hope that I kind of answered the question. Steve, any anything? Yeah. So so I I think people get caught up in absolutes. And and what I mean by that is, you know, when you're looking at SAT scores or GPAs or rigorous schedule or socioeconomic backgrounds, you know. It, 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 it's, it's almost like putting, you know, marbles in a jar, right? The jar is not going to be empty if you take one or two marbles out. But the more marbles you can put in the jar, the fuller it's going to look. And, 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 I, and, you know, so that's why I think people need to be a little open-minded about and not look at every detail as a make or break, Right. Can you get into Johns Hopkins without a phenomenal SAT score? You absolutely can, right? But it does make it easier if, if you have one. You know, will a coach take a 2.8 GPA high school player on their roster? They do it every year. But boy, it's a lot easier if you had a 3.6, right? So all these things, in an, each one of them in and of themselves, is is rarely a deal breaker. You know, and I'm making general statements here. Is rarely a deal breaker. Um, it's the additive effect, right? Have a 2.8 GPA, be a soccer player that they see, you know, pretty commonly, and get a 900 on your SAT. Man, that, that coach is going to be thinking long and hard 
before they offer you even even a walk on spot. And and I and I and I think people just get caught up too much in absolute. So, you know, I know the quarterback who went to that school and they only had a twelve hundred on the on the SATs. Yeah, you're not playing football. So. And, 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 and you're not a player that's going to help that coach win their conference and make a difference and, and help them keep their job. And yeah. And in soccer, the number that I tend to use is top 15. If that coach doesn't see you as being a player who will get playing time in their freshman year and by the sophomore year, be a true difference maker in their team. Don't expect favors based on, a substandard test score or a substandard GPA. So, so Don, I have a question for you because I've heard this before and maybe Erica, you could chime in. When, so there's been talk and I, and I don't know exactly the details about college coaches having team GPAs be part of their KPI. Oh, geez acronym world here be, be be part of how they're graded from the administration so that sometimes they may take a kid who they see is 18 19 on their roster who's going to give them a 4.0 because that kid who's two or three on their roster might only have a 2.8 how how much of that actually happens I can't really uh, speak to that, well, but, yeah. um, I mean, I can kind of speak to it with, with Johns Hopkins. So uh, a couple years ago, Johns Hopkins made it into the top 10 schools and then they were on the global scale as well. I believe in the top five, but, uh, when that happened, that's when the administration cracked down on the athletics, especially the D three athletics. And we're like, okay, like we're changing all these requirements. Um, we're rarely going to give, give any passes here, but it's funny because with men's lacrosse, (laughs) it's a little bit different. (laughs) So there's probably like five, like studs coming in on the men's lacrosse team, but they're barely getting like a 2.0 in high school yet. They're still getting into Hopkins. Um, so it, it like just varies based on the team there. And, and that's the only thing that I can really speak to. And to Steve's point, yes, I've seen it happen with athletes not having certain grade requirements, but if you're a stud, it's, it's probable, um, you know, uh, I don't want to say you're not, you're not going to, you're not going to get in because there are those rare situations. But again, as Steve said, when you have good grades, you have the good SAT, it makes it a lot easier. Yeah. And, and, and I really don't know the exact answer to that question, Steve. Um, I've worked at enough schools and I've talked to enough administrators and I've had enough friends that have shared with me their experience at their schools with their administrators to know Again, that can vary from year to year, from team to team, depending on the culture of that school. So one of the things that I talk about in the recruiting process is, you know, look at the total overall athletics culture. That will tell you how well the administration uh, hires. And it will also tell you how that administration sees athletics as fitting into that school. In other words, if the volleyball team and baseball team and basketball team and soccer team and whatever other team all have above a 3.0 cumulative GPA for their for their team, uh, that's pretty good for a state school. That's pretty good. That's not bad. Um, And if they have a 2.7, that's something different. Uh, And if they have a lot of fluctuation of players dropping out and players leaving the team and dropping out of school. And, and there's a lot of movement within all of the teams, except the one soccer team, that one soccer team, those kids have a 3.5 GPA and that one soccer team, those kids are doing community service and really involved and around the campus and that one team. Well, what that tells me is that overall the athletics department's a mess 
players be careful because if that soccer coach leaves and a new soccer coach comes in, I'm not sure how well that athletic department hires. And I'm not sure I'm suspect. Be careful about who the new coach is. But if the overall athletic department every year just seems to be rocking and on all cylinders, very involved in, in the school and very good grades and student leaders and all of that, chances are that athletic administration knows how to hire, knows how to hire players. So speaking to what you're saying, Eric, and what I'm trying to get at is that that can fluctuate and change as to what that school wants and how they see athletics as playing into that school. Again, we're talking about a huge number of schools in this country. On the men's side, it's 1,300. On the women's side, it's over 1,600 uh, of schools. And so there can be a lot of variance in there. So I think what I was trying to, to, to get you to answer is you had spoken about your top 15, right? And that's from a soccer ability standpoint. And how you weigh grades on that top 15 may be differently than how you weigh grades on your back end 15. Yes, no? I'm not hearing that a lot from the coaches that I speak to. Nobody's really speaking to that. Uh, fact is, I think our kids are probably better than average. And yet I still have college coaches saying, yeah, 4.0 is still not good enough to play here. I mean, they're, they're either good enough to play here or not good enough to play here. Uh, no, I don't think, I always say this, that I don't think any college coach needs help finding number 27, 28, 29, 30 on the roster. They can go grab that at the guy down the street who's just okay and probably never going to play for him and it has a 4.0 and they know their parents and their parents went to school there. I'll just take that kid. Why would I gamble taking a kid from the other side of the country or the other side of the world? I even know who they are. I'm look, the kid's not going to play for me either way, or at least not till their junior and senior year, at least from how I see them at this standpoint, that can change. They, they don't need help finding those kids. And so I don't think, and I'm not, that's not to say Steve, that there isn't a school out there that says we need to boost our GPA and we'll do it with numbers. 21, 22, 25, 28, 29, all having 4.0s, even though they're not very good. Because what's the difference? They're not going to play anyways. Not to say that that doesn't happen. It probably does. I just don't know who they are. Another thing I, I want to say to that is, Don, you said that there's a lot of changes and it, it's never set in stone as far as the, the grade requirements and team GPAs. And one thing I saw at Hopkins over the years was, there was an athletic director switch. And that was also when the academic requirements got more intense. Um, and ADs are always changing. <laughs> so that's another factor that plays into it. I believe the AD came from a UPenn or a another really high academic school. So of course, when she comes in, she cracks down and she's like, you know, I want to look good. So these coaches below me need to be having these requirements. Otherwise, like I'm new to this, this school and I want to make sure that the academics are good within the athletes. So that was also another variable. Yeah. The, the average lifespan of, a, of an administrator in the United States is three and a half years at a specific school. So they are moving and fluxing in and out and that can change how it does. I mean, it usually flows from the board of trustees to the president, from the president to their various administrators. That's usually how it flows down. So when you get massive big changeovers uh, in, in what the board of trustees wants, uh, then they hire a specific president who seems to match that, who then hires specific athletic directors in our case that seems to match that. And then they all work together to try to socially engineer that school. So. Yeah, it's it's not it's very rarely set in stone. Look, you get to a certain level of a certain school at Cal State East Bay, nothing ever changed really. What changed? Oh, you got an extra scholarship this year. That was great. That that's awesome. Uh, we're gonna bump we're gonna bump you bump you up to this. But nobody ever came in and told us uh, we want more Latino students. That's what we want. We want more African American students. That's what we want. Nobody ever told us as 
as a department, you know, as a team, that this is exactly what we want because it's not they don't it's not like the school is in that much demand to be able to do they're happy to fill the classrooms they're happy to be able to pay the teachers they're happy to be able to pay the bills so it 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 is a little different at the state level state school level and except for the big flagship schools in the big states with the big names right the Penn states the charlottes the uclas you know just trying to cover the cover the coast there yeah so I, I think to just summarize this discussion, academics are important. <laughs> um, some schools might be a little bit more flexible than others, but if you're looking to have an edge and to stand out in this competitive climate, then yes, it is going to give you a boost. But if you're also looking for financial aid, please consider the academic scholarships and just really doing well on your tests, having a good course schedule and, and a good GPA, because that is that is the big thing that that's going to make the difference as a lot of athletic scholarships aren't, aren't being given out as much at the D3 schools and, and some of the D1 and the, the state schools. So academics, critical uh, to summarize anything else you guys you just want to end on, Steve? So. So I, I would, I, I just want to caution folks away from, you know, I hear, hear it a lot. Oh, soccer is going to make the difference. I can't get into this stuff, and stuff, but I'm such a phenomenal player. It's going to make the difference. Don's been around longer than I, but I could probably count the kids that got into a top end academic school for purely sports on one hand. I mean, I, I can't say it never happens, but you know, go down to the local grocery store and buy yourself a lottery ticket if that's what you're counting on. Because, you know, it's not a revenue sport. And and so, you know, if you're if you're going to go to X camp and you're courting this school because it's a great high academic school and stuff and you and you just don't have the grades it is highly unlikely your sport or our sport is going to get you in exactly steve i, I couldn't I, you know cautionary tales right i love cautionary tales my own son had spent two years in england decided he was going to come back to the united states basically wrote the top 25 division one schools in the country um uh, uh, Harvard was one of them. John Kerr had at that time had Harvard just rocking. And John Kerr called and said, hey, send me over his transcripts. This is interesting. And sent them over his high school transcripts and then called me up and was literally giggling. It's like, he's never getting into Harvard with these grades. And I said, well, you asked. You asked me to send over the transcript. You didn't ask me what his grades are. I sent them over. I, I don't know. I don't know what leeway you have. And he goes, Don, he just can't can't get into Harvard with these grades. And you know what my son's response was? Geez, if when I was in high school, I had known that there was a chance to go to Harvard and play for coach John Kerr, I could have gotten better grades. I thought I was just going to a state school. So I'd like parents to know that story. Don't be sorry. I'd like kids to hear that story. Don't be sorry. Don't, don't be regretful. Just pay attention. Grades matter. And it, it matters. And I, and I, besides just the grades and themselves, I think the feeling of going into a challenging situation and accomplishing tasks, coming out above average, well above average, there's a good feeling there. And I think there's a lesson for kids to learn in that. Uh, take it all seriously. Try to be good at everything you do, not just one thing. Don't put all your eggs in one basket. Thanks for those final words, you guys. This was a really great discussion. I think it will open people's eyes and just provide them with some good insight as far as the academic requirements for all of these schools. If you guys enjoyed the conversation and you want us to do another roundtable like this on more college recruiting, please like the video and leave a comment as well and just ask us any questions. I'll also leave Don and Steve's Twitter handles in the caption below, as well as the SRUSA website. So please connect with them, follow them, 
engage with them. They're, they're always open to discussion and, and questions. So Don and Steve, thank you again.